it, you know, I lost my faith in God and magical things. And art was a lot of bringing that back into my life of something in this is outside of my control. Like inviting that air of unpredictability and uncertainty. That's, that's very hard to get with digital because you see what you did a 500th of a second later in exactness. And for some people, that's such a great asset of producing consistent technical work for clients. But for me, nothing about that was helpful to what I was trying to make. The goal isn't to live forever. The goal is to create something that will. Welcome to Perspective, a podcast for when craves, where we sit down often with a special guest and talk about our many years of experience in the wedding industry so you can learn from us and grow your wedding business. Wait, a wedding this podcast? I think I'm on the wrong show already. <laughs> 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 this episode has been a long time coming, listeners. In fact, I've had to wrangle a few uh, a few of my friends to uh, to aid in bringing on today's guest, the one, the only ghost shaped person, Ryan Muirhead. As I'm With, discovering, uh, I'm not the only though. I keep searching my name, and there's some like Scottish <laughs> sports player that's getting all the Reddit posts. So I got to get. Oh, rid really? Of <laughs> I didn't discover him in my uh, post-show research. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, with a focus on emotional provocative images that he liked to describe as the opposite to an advertisement. Work that might be beautiful but doesn't exist to make you jealous. Ryan creates not for others but for himself and for the people he works with. It's been over a decade since art found its way into Ryan's life. So let's get to know what that time has gifted him in this episode. An episode, of course, sponsored by With Jack and Wooden Banana, with a special mention to the folks over at Pick Time. They're one of my friends who helped put this together. So thank you. Uh, awesome. I love the that. Wooden Banana <laughs> and Pick Time people. <laughs> oh, yeah, they're so good. Yeah. But I will go into that a little bit later in the show. However,. Greg, who's not in the studio and who's actually in his house because he's a lazy bum. How are you doing and what are you drinking? Yeah, so as you can see, I'm not in the office. So to prove that we're not coffee snobs, I've got an espresso coffee show for my drink. So we don't always just drink filter coffee. But uh, yeah, basic Nespresso capsule for me. Delicious. And um, uh, I, I came into the studio today and it's fucking like a hundred degrees in this room Ooh, i'm actually really glad fuck? i didn't know i was gonna oh, ask you, actually yeah. but you can you, swear it's very very, very 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 casual very casual Great. um that's terrible i should, really should you know that should be in the mentions when we <laughs> you know the pre-show before we hit record uh you can do anything you want ryan uh but yeah it's like a hundred degrees in here so i'm if you're watching this youtube uh i'm pure sweat in here uh but i do have a thing of coffee mm-hmm. mike's over here uh but I've put ice in it, but I forgot my cup. So I'm just drinking it from the, whatever this thing is called, this glass thing <laughs> that holds all the coffee. <laughs> I am out of my mind today. <laughs> but Ryan, thank you very much for joining us. How are you and what are you drinking? Um, nothing fancy for me. I just had my seven morning Red Bulls and now I'm going to try and transition to at least a half cup of water. <laughs> Now is this full? Is this full sugar Red Bull, or are you like me? Do you like the the light blue colored one, the zero calorie, whatever it is? Oh, I'm just kidding. I can't drink those. They taste like Smarties and piss. <laughs> <laughs> Mixed together. Those are yeah. my favorite things. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm having coffee snob Pacific Northwest glorious filter coffee. Mm. Lovely. I actually, sorry, listeners, I forgot to. Um, pick up the bag of what I'm drinking, but it's Wolf Fox, but I don't have the right bag here. Sorry. Is it like important to listeners to know what coffee people are drinking? I guess uh, it is. The, uh, it's, it is the wedding it, industry. It's like <laughs> weddings and hipster coffee. Like you have, you're required to participate. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, we've just been drinking coffee for quite a long time. Even uh, was it, I mean, it seems really cool now to be drinking coffee, which is a, what I don't like about it, but 
I, I'm addicted <laughs> at this point. Um, you don't like it because it's cool. So true hipster fashion. <laughs> true <laughs> hipster fashion right here. Yes, absolutely. Uh, no, but actually, I was having this conversation online with someone about coffee. And it just, you know, when you have a favorite food or a childhood memory, like for me, when I when I start brewing a coffee, you know, on, on a filter or a percolator, it just takes me back to my childhood. You know, when I'm when I'm at my grand's, and maybe it's Chris, you know, it's Christmas morning, and that's the smell that emanates throughout the whole house, and that smell just brings me back right there. So what that's a more probably fun- why I'm addicted to coffee. What a more fun association. When I drink a coffee, I remember, oh, right, for 30 years of your life, if you had this drink, you were going to go to hell. I grew up what? Mormon. I grew up Mormon. Oh, right. You're not allowed to drink coffee. It's a serious enough violation to keep you out of attending a family member's wedding if you drink a coffee. Wow. Uh, you know, I, didn't I, know that I, part of it. I, I did yeah. not know that part yeah. either. Wow. You said you used to be? You left? Yeah, I grew up Mormon, and I left when I was about 30. I don't mean to offend anyone, but I cannot recommend it. It did not go well for me. Mm, fair enough. Uh, Greg, you don't, you're not really a religious Greg, person. you're Mormon, right? Let's get into the awkward <laughs> straight away. Oh, I'm so offended. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't, I don't practice or follow any religion, no. Yeah, but I don't, I mean, we, I don't, at the same time, I don't, like, call myself an atheist either just ah, fair enough i think you've talked about this before simon and there's a word for what you call is it agnostic when i just don't really care about yeah religion <laughs> not the not, not that you don't care just that you don't know so yeah. that's where your stance is all oh, right okay <laughs> uh there's a little bit of confusion online uh with atheism and uh, agnost- agnosticism uh basically one is saying basically there is no god the other is i don't know so yeah however you want to (laughs) go all right so we've covered religion politics how's everyone feeling (laughs) terrible everyone's excited for trump's as for trump's return as i am Mm. that is a joke that is a joke Oh my God! He's not returning, is he? Bloody hell! Okay, let's skip that. That was a, that was a terrible segue. Mm. So, how have you been? Because we tried to do this episode what a week or two ago, and then power, cut power outage. So, oh so how yeah, have you been yeah. The last week or two. Um, okay. Interestingly enough, I think I think one of the true fascinations of the last ten years of my photography career is that most of my money has come from teaching to wedding photographers, speaking at wedding photography conferences, doing wedding photography podcasts, and I've never shot a wedding, and I don't want to. But mm. within the last week, I shot my first ever elopement. Ooh. What? Um, so- someone wrote me an email. They did it exactly right, so kudos to them for getting it to happen. They wrote me an email with my little heart and skull emoticon that I put on everything, and they wrote... <laughs> yeah. I want you to shoot this elopement. Don't delete this yet. <laughs> Please read the rest of this email. And it just said, uh, my fiance is a huge fan of your work. She's followed you since Tumblr, which was like 13 Oof. years ago. So almost like the very start. Uh, we, we drove to your first gallery show. I had my first solo gallery show at the Leica Gallery in Boston on the opposite mm-hmm. side of the U.S. from where I live, so almost no one I know could make it. And they drove to the show and came, which I didn't remember, which is a fun little embarrassing tidbit. Um, but they just said, I know you don't want to do it. I know you don't take money. for. Wor- I know you're not looking for clients, but we want you to do it. You can do what ever you want. We just want to spend the day with you. We love the way you do things. We don't have any expectations. We don't have any specific photo needs. We don't have anything you have to deliver on to do this. Just spend the day with us and take whatever you want. And I was like, uh, yep, that's it. I mean, in, in that's, that's always been the huge hang up is as soon as someone's paying you, you need to be $1,000 good. You need to expectation some Buddhist thing I guess that it's you know expectation is suffering it really hits me that if you have to deliver something this good or this valuable I'm instantly in a space of well what if it isn't and then Mm. it's very hard for me to get outside of that you know 
I'm pretty, I'm not a very good capitalist. If I had the means to survive, I'd do everything for free because I'm in such a better headspace for me of, oh, this is what it looks like to me. And does this work for them? Never has to enter the equation. You know, in my own work, it's like it only has to work for me and the person I'm with and they're not paying me. So it's just whatever we do. And as soon as the, I hired you to do this gets put into it, I, I hate it. And my brain shuts off. I turn into a worse photographer than someone just starting because I'm not a problem solver and I'm not enthusiastic. Like we can do this. I can grow this. I'm going to impress them. Like those just aren't in my wheelhouse of skills, but they said that. Yeah. And I just got the film back last night and some of them are really beautiful and yeah. uh, and they lived up to the experience they really didn't have a like well i know we said that but can you get all this stuff you yeah. know that we need this to be they really didn't and it turned and it was a really lovely experience actually yeah that's what i was yeah. thinking like a lot of people will contact us and be like oh hey we want you just do you like you've got complete so free creative reign with us do whatever you want with the film but then really you're like well you've kind of structured the day to get what you want out of this but it sounds like that couple really did want you just to do you. Yeah, and I'm not shitting on that either. I mean, people that are amazing business people and make people feel comfortable and put them into situations and create something for them, man, I admire it. I just hate doing it. Mm. Yeah. That's why I'm so, poor. <laughs> <laughs> well, well t tell, us, tell us about the day. Like, what, what did you do with them? Like, what is a, what is a right in your head a little bit? You know, I, I really tried to, like, structure it in i mean really they went all out they were do you guys know where maine is the opposite side of our country like california is on this okay. coast maine is on the ocean on the other yep. coast they yep. drove to me in portland across the entire oh, country shit. like they said you know because i don't know i think they were just trying to get me to agree to do it and if they were like well we'll bring you out here i probably just would have been like nah and so they were like, we'll drive to you. Just take us anywhere you want in Portland. They didn't give me a like, we got to see the coast. We got to go somewhere beautiful. They said anything you want. So I tried to st structure it just like would, what would make sense to me. The day, mm. like you said in your, in, clearly you've read some whatever I try to write about my work. But before yes. the day, we went to dinner together uh, the first night, which has been, which has become something really important to me in my workshops. I had this, you know, I've taught a lot and I had this revelation of you always get to this point of, well, you have to do it like, you know, you have to do it like this. There's no way around it. And one of yeah. those things was everybody introducing them on the first themselves on the first day of the workshop. So you walk into a room together with 12 introverted extroverts and then you start going around the room and you're like, hi, my name's Julie. I'm from Kansas. I have three sisters. I just got the new Canon r5 and in three minutes i'm like oh my god i don't care this is so boring no one wants to say this no one wants to hear it and we're about to do this for an hour and i brought these people together to share a meaningful personal experience and it's off to the worst start and i did that like 10 times like what are you gonna do you gotta do it and eventually i was like why why do we have to do this so now every time i teach the night before we have dinner together everyone has to meet for dinner because then you sit down, you have real conversations, you share food, and then the next morning you walked in the room and it's like, oh, hey, you guys again, let's talk about something. And so I did the same thing with a couple. I said, I want to have dinner the night before we go do the shooting stuff for the day. Um, just so at the start of the morning, we wouldn't get off to the like, oh, hey, I'm Ryan. Thanks for coming. What do you want to do? I guess we could go here. This, this could be nice. So, yeah, the first thing I did was ha have them over to my house for dinner. And as we like sat and really got into it, they were sitting under the lights of my kitchen counter. And I went and grabbed my film camera because I loved just shooting with any light there was. And we did the first round of portraits under the light bulb in my kitchen, which uh, is nice. how I shoot yeah. anyway. And I think it just set a really nice tone for the day afterwards. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that's probably one thing that a lot of wedding photographers a lot of wedding filmmakers get in the rhythm of is like um structuring time to shoot and it's quite mechanical you know like i'm gonna do this after this and i'm gonna go here after going here and it's very much a structured you know 
after ceremony, there's this. Oh, and you got to tell the guests to go here, and then this, and then this. And I suppose it works to some degree. Yeah. So it was quite nice that you you just didn't you didn't even think that way. You're yeah. just I'm just gonna. There's a moment here. Yeah. And you're gonna grab. I mean, hand. I had to teach Let's myself go. that. You know, for the longest time, mm. honestly, the longest time, like four or five years of the first year of my shooting, I had this recurring thought of like you can't do this. You're never going to be good at this. You don't have ideas for photos. You don't know how to structure this time together to make these shots happen. Like, I'm not sure you have the personality and skill set to like do this at all. And I really had, Mm. you know, and I wanted to shoot models because there are people volunteering to be shot and I was too scared to ask people to shoot. But then I was, had these locations and these stylists and these, all this stuff. And I tried it for like three years before I was like, I don't even like this. And finally, I just had to admit a bunch of stuff to myself, like, well, that isn't what you do. You find people you're interested in and you spend time where maybe it's not a photo shoot. And because constantly in those moments, you're seeing things like, oh, this is beautiful. This would make such an interesting shot. But that was always like crushed by the, well, the stylist is here. We have to shoot in this location, forcing all that stuff. And eventually I just quit doing it. And I think that really Mm -hmm. admitting a ton of my stuff to myself about what I liked and didn't finally just gave me the permission to be like, oh, your shooting style is just different. I, we just have to yeah. pursue that more, I was going to say authentically, but wow, and that's another hipster, scary buzzword. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how, how did you even, was it just like time in this situation just forced that revelation out of you? Or like, was there a trigger like, oh shit, I'm, I'm really not happy doing this. So I'm now going to do the things that make me happy. Like, was there a moment in there? I, I, I guess if I had to point to a singular moment, um, I went, I've been to one workshop myself that I like photography paid to attend. And it was this fashion photographer and I thought her work was so emotional and beautiful and personal. And I had all this stuff I was missing in my work. And we went there and in the first thing in the room, she was like, all right, now everyone's going to get up and dance together to break the tension and dancing. I, I, it Petra, I hate it. It makes me so uncomfortable. Mm. Not just like, well, that's the point you're getting out of your comfort zone. Like it really like almost physically traumatizes me. And I, and I was like, no, I'm, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to. And then watching her for like 10 more minutes, it was like, Oh shit. Her work looks like this because of how she is. And, and it was a real confronting moment of like, are you done? Like it, th- work looks like this because of how, because people have different personality traits than you. So it, mm-hmm. it was kind of a distressing experience, t- but it was worth the money just for the revelation of you either have to find a way to do this that feels meaningful to you because you're never going to make it through the fake it till you make it stuff. You know, you're never going to put on this front of who you're not to get this work. Like it's not going to happen. So yeah, start finding ways of communicating, ways of spending time with people, ways of even photographing, ways of even talking where you don't have to participate in this stuff that you feel you can't do. And it's going to be really different. You know, that's why most of the people I shoot are my friends, why I'm not like a collector of persons, why I'm not trying to make connections and shoot for brands and for the stuff because I, I just, I can't, I'm really good at doing something I really, really want to do. And I'm tremendously awful at doing something I don't. Mm. Yeah. I, I think a few guests on this podcast and may, maybe even us at some point have said that phrase, uh, fake it till you make it. And uh, I've thought about this over the years. I don't know why that phrase, but it's one that's come back to me. And I feel like it's it's not a it's not a good it's not a good um, phrase. It's not a good workflow for somebody to to do because I feel like there's a, an element of just like you said, proving your worth. You just you just gotta keep doing doing it, doing it, doing it. There's only so many ways you can smack your head off the wall and, and you know, st- 
remain happy or, or I don't know. Yeah, I just want to be clear though. Uh, I'm 41 now, and I maybe I'm getting a tiny bit of wisdom for myself with age. I am not in the advice giving business at all. I don't have mm-hmm. any opinions on how people should do things. When I was younger and starting to love my work and feeling passionate about it and making important work and having dreams come true in these connections, I had a little bit more of the like, let me share my inspiring Pinterest quotes with you now. But th- that's really starting to leave me. Like everybody's so different and in yeah. such a different place that if you fake it till you make it and you work on stuff you hate, but it provides money for your family and is building part of a life that's important to you amazing it doesn't work for me but i have no opinions on how people should do things <laughs> yeah when you were creating important work did you say yeah is your work not Im- do you not f- feel that your work is important now i suppose important to who important to you important to other people i think it's important to me and the people i photograph and i've distilled it down to that because i really have created yeah. some shoots without expectation and it's on it it's led to some surprising results to be honest i have Mm -hmm. my favorite image i've ever made without question i have a lot i feel like a lot of photographers don't but i have a number one I, i can look at it and say this is it this is what i was trying to make my whole life and this is the best thing i've ever produced and i actually have a top yeah. three favorite images i've ever made in my whole life and none of them are online all right i when I got to that point for myself where I could tell, you know, where I didn't have to convince myself. I didn't have to be like, I think this is it. I think you've arrived. This is really good for you. Like the scan came up from the lab the first time, you know, I'm shooting film. So the first time I saw the image was actually a little bit of a revelation, you know, weeks later and it came up and I just had this like, Oh oh my God. Oh my God. That's it. And then, Mm. you know, as I sat there, maybe trying to write the Instagram post for it of like, hey, just wanted to share something new and awesome for me. You know, I I, I couldn't make it two sentences before I was like, oh, wow, I I don't think social media (laughs) gets to have this, which is fine. You know, my favorite image ever is of someone fairly well known and super talented. And it was an unbelievable special experience for both of us. And when I wrote to him, I was like, I, I don't think I'm, this is my favorite thing I've ever made in my whole life. And I don't think I'm going to share it. And she was, she was totally on board. She hasn't shared it either. She was like, that's fine. The whole thing we did was for us. That was the whole structure of the time we spent together. We had a really special moment of sharing some very personal stuff. And then both saying to the other person, do anything you want. Like this, we got 45 minutes and this can be anything really. Like if we don't, we even said up front, if we don't, I was shooting expired film. We were doing long exposures. She was moving and dancing. There was music and stuff. And I really had the thought of like, these might not be good even. Is that okay? And we both settled on, it doesn't matter if we get anything out of this. And then of course I end up getting my favorite thing ever but the whole spirit of the like, and you know, I show it when I teach and I have prints of it and some, my best friend has a big print of it on his, I've, several of my closest friends and family have beautiful prints of this image, but it, it's for that, you know, it's not for the internet. Yeah. yeah. That's cool that she was on the same page as you though. Like you could quite easily imagine she'd be like, oh no, I really want to share this. But she, still, she's been, she's been in, you know, she's been in vogue. She's mm. been shot by some extremely famous people for some extremely high profile stuff. So it was, I think it was nice for both of us to have a detour in, you know, I'm a good photographer and I'm going to produce this beautiful work for us. And you're so talented and you've made all this amazing content, man, you know, Instagram's going to go nuts over this. I think it was a nice break for both of us to just ditch a lot of where we had been coming from. And I think that's why it ended up as my favorite thing. It was made from such a unique space and I didn't want to throw it into the meat grinder of the non-unique space where everything goes. Hmm. That's really interesting. I'm just trying to think of how many people would recognize an experience like that and, and, and not share it. I I mean, it wasn't from, you know, it's not my high minded moral superiority that came up with this. I mean, I think I probably tried. I think on three of these images, you know, you look at it and you're like, 
we all just want to be loved and recognition and to succeed and have people celebrate our greatest work, but people get to hold it in print and people get to see it at conferences and workshops when I speak about things that really, really care to me. And I don't have to worry if it's going to hit the algorithm and I don't have to worry if someone's going to write like they're ugly, you know, on an Instagram comment or some, you know, I don't, it's not made for yeah. that venue. Mm -hmm. Maybe I thought it was, but I don't know. I'm pretty introspective about my own work. Yeah. Talking about your work, I was trying to buy some prints of yours uh, maybe a couple of months back. They're very hard to get. I was using your pick time gallery. I was using your pick time gallery, and I was loving it. <laughs> it's actually the first time I've actually used pick time as a, as a customer to try and buy prints, and I would thoroughly recommend it. <laughs> it's a very nice experience. What do you mean they were hard to get? You couldn't do it? I couldn't do it. They're all sold out. What? They're all sold out. <laughs> I know. Quick, go on. Maybe, up maybe I'll go back up and have a look. Gallery. <laughs> God. Something about that doesn't seem right. I just got international shipping set up through my lab, so it should work now. That's, hmm. Oh, okay. I well, me, well, I will, I will, I'll give it another go. And if I'm unsuccessful, I'll, if I'm unsuccessful, I will let you, you want know. a qu quick little um, pick time shout out of why they're so special to me? Yeah. We, I, we love yes, them Yes, I was actually so, going to go into pick time. Yeah, share, because, share your thoughts. I don't, I don't know if Amir will be embarrassed, but the way we met is I was speaking at a conference and I was sharing some of this work that was so personal to me and it was a really emotional talk for me and I had had a niece that had died and I photographed her death and funeral and I had made some art in a different category that was just really personal to me and I was sharing a lot of this for maybe not the first time, but really early on and even processing it for myself and Right when it was over, pick time at a booth in the room and Amir came up to the front right after I was done speaking and didn't really say much, but like gave me a hug and was like, thanks. And then Narit came up right after and she was like, I have never seen my husband do that. But she was like, we, we loved this. We, we want to be friends. We run this company pick time. Like it, they didn't pitch me on the company. I mean, they were just introducing themselves and then they were telling me about the yeah. company and I was like, oh yeah, I don't need that. I don't, I don't want that. You know, like I don't really, I'm not trying to get clients or deliver images or anything. Mm -hmm. And they both were like, Oh, we don't care. We just want to, we just want to stay connected and involved. And they've, they've paid for me to go to conferences and speak. Not for, not for, I don't, I don't know if I should share this. I don't know if it's like bad information, but they took me to Copenhagen to speak. And their explanation was, I think what you're saying is valuable and important for people to hear. And it had no connection to their business. Like they've been such just a special human connection. And then, and that just, I mean, you know, that's just so inherently beautiful, but then we got a chance to even collaborate on some ways that it could work. You know, like they launched the art galleries and they were talking to yeah. me a lot yeah. when they were developing it. And they said like, what, you know, what would make this meaningful to you? And I said, I'm so much more comfortable talking about my work than writing about it. I don't write well at all, but I feel like when I just sit and talk, I can do it. And they said, oh, we'll add, you, we'll add audio clips if you want. You can add audio below your photos and you can just record yourself talking and then people can just listen to it. And I, I said, wow, that's, that's a fantastic idea. So, and now, now I do, now I use them for my print sales and stuff, but I don't yeah. know. That kind of just circles back to, trying to stay true or relevant about that. Like, I don't want to do this in a way I don't want to do it. And it led to mm -hmm. some people saying, oh, well, we do a thing you don't even want to use, but we love what you're saying and doing. And I loved what they said they were doing. And it led to a much more sincere, beautiful relationship, both personally and like with the company. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, uh, well, while we're talking, I'll, Shout out to Aga, who actually, like I said this in the intro, helped put you in touch with me, uh, or me in touch with you, you rather. Um, it was, um, but there was a little bit of a stipulation in there, which I thought was really funny. And I don't know if that was just Aga joking around, because she, she can kind of be funny that way. 
but the stipulation was um, that we had to either put on a workshop and fly you over to Europe or find an event organizer to convince them to do the same. <laughs> so I remember that I night. Think I knew and I'm thinking, <laughs> but oh, no, but that's. I, <laughs> So uh, well, when I got that message, I was like, oh, okay, a challenge. I like this. Okay, so I'm like, who do I know? Well, obviously, Greg and I can't put on a workshop yet um, and fly you over. But I do know Cole Roberts over at Way Up North. That, I'll just give him a wee message. That's what... And literally, it was... Oh, Way Up North is what Picktime brought me to in Copenhagen. I spoke in, uh, for them yes. in Rome and Copenhagen. Yes. Well, I, I gave Cole a quick wee message just to be like, hey, can you give me like a soft promise that you'll get Ryan your head back, please? And he was like, uh, he can't come to the next one, but I'm sure, you know, we can work something out. And I'm like, right, that's perfect. I, uh, I've kind of kind of done perfect. it. This, this will do, right? <laughs> that's amazing with Aga. <laughs> I, I have and another uh, really I good just, quick yeah. Aga story of how sweet she is. We were at, and we were, oh, yes, we were me, at, at an event. Oh, I'm going to have to get it. It's in my closet right there. We're at a uh, conference to together and she had this amazing red white and blue like almost like houndstooth like patterned floor length coat and i saw it and i just fell in okay. love with it i love getting in costume i love getting dressed up but i never seem to do it and she let me wear it the week and it's like a really special coat and she had all these stories attached to it and then at the end of the conference i was like well Aga, can i have it and she was like Wow, that's presumptuous. Like, <laughs> it's beautiful. It's like my favorite coat. And I let you borrow it. And your reaction is like, why aren't you letting me keep it? She was like, no, you can't keep it. It's like, mm, that's fair. <laughs> and then like um, two years later, we were at another conference and we just showed up and she was like, hey, I have something for you. And she took me to her room and she was like, you were right. You know, it did belong to you. Like, here you go. You really should have it. And then I felt really happy because it's such an amazing coat, but really bad. Like you can guilt people into giving you their favorite items. Here, I got to show you. It's just right in the closet. <laughs> See, that's how nice that. Put it on as well. She's, one, on. she's one of my favorite people. I know. I know Ryan can't even hear me, but she's one of my favorite people. Oh, nice. Uh huh. Can can we see the back? What? Can, can oh, we yeah, see the back as well? Can you do a wee turn? <laughs> yeah. Bow, 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 bow. Yeah, nice. <laughs> yeah, so I guilted a really sweet person into giving me their favorite clothing item. That's that's a story of, of Amazing. how horrible I am. <laughs> or how nice I guys. <laughs> yeah, that's probably a, that's yes, probably a better uh, indicator. <laughs> Um, absolutely. Well, hello, Aga, if you're listening. In fact, I know you are listening, but thank you. And I say my love. I know you are listening. Um, That's how you guilt people to listeners. Like, hey, mom, I know you're listening. My, all my friends, I know you're tuning in. Hey, our moms were the first listeners. I will let that be known right now. <laughs> uh, in fact, she probably still listens. I'm not going to lie. Um, okay, Ryan. Uh, ghost shaped people. Where did where did this name I come from? I actually really oh. like this story. Yeah. So, another thing that's important to me when you know you're not trying to book clients, you're not trying to grow your brand. Something that became important to me is, man, I can just never tell a short story. I ph okay. photography doesn't it. inspire me. It. People are like. Go look at amazing photography. I look at amazing photography and I think, wow, this sucks. I wish I was that good or I wish I had made that. And then I just feel sad about being a photographer. So when I'm trying to like soak up inspiration, I'm trying to pay attention to things to me that make me feel something very unique that aren't tied to photography and aren't even like directly translatable, not like oh, I saw this sculpture and now I'm going to interpret bodies or this movement into my photography. It's more like I'm seeking these moments of you really, really felt something there and remember that that's possible. Remember that phrases and not pictures, that just these things can hit you in a way of I want to be in this space. I want to feel things like this. I want to reflect on this. And then as you go to be an artist, like search for those spaces for yourself. That's kind of how inspiration works for me more than I saw a movie and I got a good idea or I saw this light and it really wanted, wanted me to make an image. One of the most 
It's not right now. I changed it to a picture of my cat. But my Instagram photo is usually a picture of a fetus, a human fetus from a m- museum exhibit that I saw yeah. and was just stunned by it. And, you know, I took a photo and I really liked the photo, but it was way more so that I couldn't get over the feeling of what I was feeling looking at it. And I made that my profile picture for mm-hmm. eight years just to keep that reminder of like, this can happen. Things not just light and imagery and photo books and movies can strike you in a way that make you want to participate in this. And the go shape people thing is another example of that. Um, one Thanksgiving, we were at my grandma's house where my mom and her sisters and her brother grew up. And there's a room in their house that nobody likes sleeping in. And I would say I'm an atheist. I don't believe in ghosts, but that room was haunted by ghosts. So, you know, life's greatest <laughs> Mysteries are always contradictions. Mm -hmm. So there's one for me. I mean, I heard noises in it outside the door. There was a closet. Everyone could feel something was in. I mean, across the board, there's a, it's Mormons. So there's a ton of grandkids and nobody liked sleeping in that room. So we were just joking about about the room, you know, sitting there and laughing. And we're like, oh yeah, it's haunted. And everyone's like, oh yeah, it's haunted for sure. And Without almost anyone in the room believing in ghosts, everyone was saying it was definitely haunted. And then we were like, oh, Beverly grew up in that room. You know, it was one of my mom's sister's rooms growing up. And she was there. So we were like, oh, yeah, get Beverly in. And we're like, Beverly, your room's haunted. And she's like, oh, I know. I grew up in it. And we were like, well, what do you mean? And she was like, oh, yeah, I used to see ghosts in there. And it's really hard to convey this because I wouldn't even say she's someone that, like, really believes in ghosts it's this weird contradiction of like we don't believe in ghosts but it's haunted and i said you saw ghosts what did they look like and she said uh i don't know just like ghost shaped people and my brain i mean it was like i had a stroke i i had that same moment because i i said wait wait that's wrong it should be people-shaped ghosts. If they're ghosts, ghost-shaped people would be us. <laughs> because you're alive for Maybe 69 years. Nice. And then <laughs> before you were born was an eternity, and after you're dead is an eternity. You're a ghost for 99.99999% of this existence. You're just a ghost-shaped person for this. And then, you know, it, it's not like a mind-blowing, meaningful breakthrough story. It, I just had this thing of like, wow, I really, really mm. felt something unique hearing that and thinking about it. And and then, you know, I think a lot of my work is melancholy and reflective and beautiful, but temporary and sad. A lot like how I feel about life and people and memories and kids and mm. all this stuff and and it just it stuck with me so much that i was i i'm trying to not say like so much because i always say like <laughs> so much but i'm just going to give up on it it's okay we've all got ticks. <laughs> that's what my work is to me and then you know i started just mm. you know i named my website that i bought the domain whatever and then when i had my first gallery show you know i don't really have like a theme to my work it's not like hey i made this body of work come to the show it's more here it is and and the gallery director mm-hmm. said well what is it called and, just, and you know there's landscapes in there there's all this stuff but i just said it's it's go shape people so that's yeah that's what yeah, i like that also mm, i like those kind of experiences that you can have with just an idea as well i just fun I fun like you can go really deep i i tend to overthink things oh Sorry, no on you fun go. segue that's also within 10 minutes i got the name of my gallery show and my work and my porn star name because in the haunted room there was this really really creepy humpty dumpty sculpture that we all hated uh, and i was trying uh-huh. to text a friend about what we were talking about and i was texting really fast and tried to type humpty dumpty and it auto corrected to gumption sumptuous and this was like five minutes after the go shape people thing. And then I stared down at that and I was like, Jesus. well, that's your porn star name. You just got the name of your body of work and your porn star name. So go shape people and gumption sumptuous happened within, I don't know, five minutes of each other. Lovely. Yeah. 
fair enough. Yeah, I know this absolutely. is the content you were hoping for on this podcast. <laughs> The, no, this this is the this is the content I live for, by the way. Because talking about photography, like I, I love I love I love doing what I do, but it can be quite a dry topic sometimes when you're just talking about, you know, oh, I take this camera to this wedding, and oh, is that just boring, and you know, people don't want to hear that. Something this isn't um, entirely related, but I just saw it again in in the very first workshop i taught i had this slide that i had completely forgotten about and it's been kind of circling back for me as i think about gear and what i need to make my work and um it, it was a paintball back when that was all the rage i don't know if it was over there but paintball was enormous here for a hot second when i was like i don't know 18 years old and there was this graphic of get to know your paintball players and the first one said novice and it was a guy in like safety glasses with like a spring action pistol with like five spare paintballs in his hand. And then it said, uh, beginner. And, you know, he was starting to get geared out. He had like the semi-automatic stuff and the better. And then it said expert. And he had like the full riot gear and two backup guns and the submachine gun paintball gun and the mm -hmm. smoke bombs and the everything. And then the last one said master. And it was the same picture as the first one. The guy with the spring action pistol and a white t-shirt and holding the five extra paintballs. <laughs> and I've been, I, I've been thinking about oh, that yeah. in photography too. Cause I mean, if I could just pan the camera, I've got 30 film cameras here and I have gear acquisition syndrome, like no one else. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I made, I made some of my favorite work ever uh, in my show, these long exposures that I did with a friend and I made them on a $5 point and shoot that I taped to the ceiling with masking tape. Mm -hmm. And my favorite camera recently, it's right next to me, so I might as well just grab it. I've been, you know, you fall in and out of love with photography and I'll go to all these fun cities. I was just in London and you take your good gear and you walk around and I'm not that good at travel work and I'm not that good at street work and I'm not that good at landscape stuff. And I was bringing my whole camera bag shooting $400 worth of film and I'd get it back and just think, these suck. You went through all this mental effort, all these settings, all this trying, all this selection, all this walking around, a whole gear bag, and they're not very good. And the disappointment ratio from how hard I was trying to how much I liked the work was really discouraging. I mean, I'm good at my portrait work and I'm good with my friends and I know how to use that gear to make work I love, but I'm a photographer. I'm interested in what's going on around me. I love seeing new places. I love trying to document and I love trying to make something special that someone could see and be like, wow, I haven't seen the space like that. And I wasn't good at it and it was discouraging over and over and over. And I finally got this Fuji GA645 which is a medium format point and shoot camera, yeah. like full auto. You just mm. hit the button, but then it has a big, beautiful negative. And in the last, like, I don't know, nine months, I've just been carrying this around and I took it to London and I'm so much happier with the work and I'm good at exposure and I'm good at film types and I'm good at the chemistry of pushing it to get a look. And I have lots of expensive lenses and lots of gear and for it's another instance of forcing something for something I just didn't feel good at. The problem wasn't hmm. getting better at it. The problem was the frustration at how hard I was trying. And when I divorced it to like, it's on P, you know, it, it's on full auto mode. All, and it doesn't zoom. All you can do is this. And I've been getting some work. I absolutely love from it in circumstances that I would say my success rate was like 10% before. And I honestly think the problem was yeah. me trying. <laughs> yeah. That is, that is, I had a very similar, uh, moment there. Cause I do, I dove into, um, uh, shooting, um, 35 mil, uh, during the lockdown, which was a couple of years ago now, which seems weird. What was that? Was it last year? I don't know. Time time works weird. Um, and yeah, I, I put together a shoot and I shot all these uh, ideas that I had and nothing came out. And that was the... Like, I was really enjoying film up until that point. And I haven't picked up a film camera to this day yet. I, like, it, it, it's really... Um, 
yeah, it really affected me. And I don't know why. But, yeah, that effort to, to yeah. award. Oh, man. It hits, it hits hard. Yeah, it, it really work. does. But, yeah. Um, I was reading your website, and there was an article uh, published by... Arc. Yeah, Sachin. Arc. Is it ARC or a- ARC? Yeah. Yeah, and then you mentioned um, your favorite question, which I found I really interesting. Remember. The question was, when was the last time oh, you... Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's all right. I've got it right here. It's, when was the last time you cried? Um, I found that really interesting. Um, that... So, Ryan, wh- when oh was the last God, time you cried? So long. I can't make myself do it. It's really hard for me, actually. I've been... I've actually shot some really mm. tragic stuff in the last few years, and... I don't know. I guess I experience it a lot more through art and processing it and making something. I have, I actually have a, that's probably why it's an interesting question to me. I go mm-hmm. years and years and years, I don't know, five or six years between crying probably. And, and that question yeah. became really interesting okay. to me out of kind of a moment when I was being an asshole. Um, one of the first times it, it re- really turned okay. into a thing was it was on Facebook and I posted a story that was important to me with an image that meant something, you know, just, you know, trying to do the whole thing. And the first comment was what camera, what lens, which, you know, we can be assholes about, but I I think that too, all the time. If you know, I think that too, all the time. That's one of my, and, and why be an asshole to someone about that? They had a reaction to the image and they wanted to interact and maybe they couldn't think of what to say and at least took the time to ask you something about it. But in my highfalutin artistic mind, I just wrote back, you know, that's not interesting. When was the last time you cried? And then in a true moment of people teaching you a lesson, uh, it's back when <laughs> the Facebook or Instagram worked and people saw my work on there, but hundreds of people answered the question with stuff about losing spouses and heartbreak and jobs and money problems and health stuff and feelings of inadequacy and tons of people Mm. answered it, which was really beautiful. And a Mm. twofold reminder to me, like not to be an asshole and that, there are interesting things to talk about. There are interesting spaces to share. There are unique interactions to be had, but it's very difficult, both be, both because we know how to get through situations without being uncomfortable or making someone uncomfortable, and we're scared. Um, and that was such a problem in my work. You know, I was trying to shoot these fashion shoots, but didn't even care, and was trying to look for these little unique, beautiful moments, but was too scared to say that's what I actually wanted the entire process to be. That's what I wanted the whole shoot to be about. And I was just trying to trick one or two out of it. And I think it probably gave me a little courage to just say, I don't really do photo shoots anymore. I spend time and I have cameras and we can be in good light. And then when a thing is the thing, we can work on getting that and making it. But I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want tips and tricks to make photos feel like things anymore. I want to be in a situation that actually feels like that and document it. Yeah. I feel like I have a very similar connection with art. When when you talk about influences and, and, and not getting influenced by photography... I get a very similar feeling in the fact that I don't really enjoy that aspect, that visual aspect. It's more like I'm looking at what it, what the experience would have been, and I get sad because I've missed it. Yeah, does that make sense? Like, I I feel uh, God, I hate I, I hate bringing this to just a Pixar movie. But, you know, and uh, I don't know if you've ever seen... Oh, shit, what's the one with all yeah. the emotions? Inside Out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Inside Out, where uh, the main character develops all the happy feelings, but there's a sadness to all of them now as she grows up. I feel like I'm feeling a lot more sadness in my life. And I do... Like, we... I put them... I put that into the wedding films <clears throat> that we do as well 
but I, I, I don't know. I, I, I get sad. I want to do so many things. It, there's something that, I mean, we've been doing, funnily enough, wedding films for so many years, but there's so many other things that I want to do that I, I actually never, I never do. I just focus on the wedding films. But I just every time I think about it, I get sad. And it's there's a sadness on the experience, and I want to put it into... I have totally lost my train of thought here. There's no question I'm leading up to this. I was just rambling. Uh, <laughs> just something that you said. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. Greg, when was the last, last time you cried? cried. <laughs> uh, we can make it happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you think could. About your, think about uh, your life, Greg. My God. It would have been, it would have been when my son was born. Like, definitely bald oh, eyes out there. that's a great one. Like, both yeah. of us just lost it. Mm-hmm. I, but I feel like I'm I'm always really mm. close to crying, but it never happens. I don't know whether I'm stopping myself. Like there's definitely times where I'll be hearing a story or whatever, and I'm like so close to crying, but I don't quite get there. But then, yeah, when my son was born, mm-hmm. that was last time I cried. That's awesome. Yeah, very nice. I very I think nice. the feeling sadness as you get older, and again, I'm not speaking for any one other than myself, but it makes a lot of sense to me. And it's given me some insight on beauty. You know, I think a lot of times we think of beauty as like the opposite of sadness. This is so beautiful. It's not sad. But I think as you get older and you watch time pass, like why is a wedding day so beautiful? Why is a baby so beautiful? I mean, you know, inherently it's aesthetics and experience and joy and uniqueness and special but some of the real beauty is in how temporary it is and how that's going to change and how that kid in 10 years is going to be like, I hate you. Like, you <laughs> suck. You're my dad. Or, you know, that couple's going to have a horrible fight or that it's not going to last. And, that you know, that's everything. It's not going to last. And that, oh, my God, it's one of the ultimate, like, catch-22s for me. Like, it's so beautiful because it's not going to last but that it's not going to last is so sad. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I think that's kind of yeah. natural to feel some of that yeah. or tons of it or a crippling and amount. Of that's it. yeah. And that was the last time I cried. I was in the bathroom and we had just, we've literally just got a brand new puppy, a dog, a first ever dog because the kid, we all wanted one, me less. So, I was very closed off to the idea because of the amount of work. But we got this puppy and the other day I went into the bathroom and I was just like overwhelmed. It was sad and fucking hell. I'm just thinking, oh, fuck. Hey. <laughs> I just, I, I just, I'm thinking about when she yeah. dies because dogs don't live that long. And, um, I don't know, thinking about my three kids going through. <laughs> Why? Yeah. Anyway, sadness is interesting and tied to everything. And um, yeah, I, I feel the same. It is beautiful, but my goodness. Uh, I'm gonna bring it to a little bit of a dry topic here. If Do you it. like what you hear topics. on this, <laughs> if you like what you hear. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash perspective by cinema. For as little as a pound, you can support the podcast. We'd really appreciate if you would support us. Um, but if not, that's absolutely fine. You can get this podcast for free wherever you get your podcast. Anyway, I'm going to hit this button again and we're going to move on to the next topic. Let's do it. <laughs> Chill beats. I, uh, yeah, sorry. I did get emotional there. I don't care. I've had like three hours sleep. The dog is like up every freaking hour to take <laughs> God. Um, that seemed really weird getting emotional there on our, on our recording of this podcast. Um, anyway, oh, Ryan, we have been talking to you for 54 minutes. However, for those of you who don't know, who are you and what do you do? Uh, I'm Ryan and I hang out all day alone with my cat. In my room. <laughs> um, I am a photographer because I don't do anything else. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm not very successful at being an artist or being a photographer. I'm mostly just a guy that is how I am that 
really find something in photographs that I needed in my life that I wasn't finding somewhere else. I really needed an outlet to make something, to get something inside out, to produce something. I don't really care about like legacy or being remembered. A lot of the times when I see my work, the thought occurs to me like, these are for your funeral. Like, I, I, I don't know what your eulogy is so, supposed to be. I don't know what you're supposed to write on your deathbed to be like, this is who I was. This was my life. It makes a lot more sense to me to just, you know, sometimes indirect hits you harder than direct. Hmm. I just, I want to make things about how I felt and I want them to be beautiful and I want them to be, I don't know. I think I'm always saying my favorite art has conflicting emotions in it. You introduced it with, I don't want my work to be an advertisement. And I think that's what I mean. Advertisements are one directional. You do not have this. If you had this, you would feel more love for yourself. Give us your money. See if it works. And in that one direction, you know, like this girl's hot, drink a beer. This country's beautiful. Where you live is shitty and rainy. If you were in Mallorca, you would like yourself and your life more. Why don't you buy the ticket and go there? And art that hits me the hardest, like I spent a month in Italy and I got to see Michelangelo's David and the Sistine Chapel and Caravaggio's paintings. And I mean, you're overwhelmed with like, oh my God, this is the most beautiful thing ever. But then it's like, oh, this is so human and happy and sad and physical and sexual and dark and religious and full of despair and violence. And there's just so much more to interact with there other than Coke is delicious. Why don't you drink one? Now I feel a sugar high. The end. I like stuff that I think about for days and I rarely think about it for days if it's just pretty. Mm. So for me, I'm always looking for stuff in my own work of this is, this is so beautiful, but I feel a little weird looking at it. And, and I've gotten there a couple times with my own work, which is awesome. And I try to seek it out in other people's work. Yeah. But how, how and when did you like discover art and in particular photography, I guess, and feel that you wanted to create something? I was Mormon not doing well emotionally and physically, not able to communicate about what was going on with me. And a special friend I had saw it and said, I think you need to make stuff. If you can't resolve this, if you can't talk about it, you should make something. And I was terrible at everything. I was terrible at drawing, terrible at sculpting, terrible at graphic design, terrible at all the artistic pursuits. And she kind of pointed out, photography is phenomenally easy. These cannons have a full auto setting on them and an L series lens. And you just point it at a thing. And on the back, it looks really good just from hitting a button. Um, and she offered to model for me. She was like, I'm going to bring a dress. I'm going to be here. You just, it was a Canon 10 D on the green box. Just point it at stuff and make something. And then I did and she showed it to some friends and a director of photography we knew. And he told me, like, this this feels like something. And, it, and that was just it. I mean, that was mm. so eye-opening and revelatory. And I think that's another talking point photographers get combative about. When I went to, you know, I went to art school. I got a BFA in photography eventually. And photography is such the bastard child of the arts. You know, all the, all the other artists are like, you're not real artists you know you have a thing that does all your stuff for you and then all the photographers get combative of like bullshit and i was like that too you know and now i'm more in their camp you know it's mm. not to say i don't love it and don't appreciate it i mean it changed my life it gave me an avenue to be an artist but i do see it as phenomenally easy in a way I mean, you know, then you have to find yourself and express yourself and get your talents and make it meaningful and find your voice and make it unique and 
emotional and all that's really hard but photography is really easy and i'm sad because if i could be michelangelo or if i could be a painter if i could sing or i could be a poet or a writer i would trade those skills in some you know god level hypothetical situation in a heartbeat but then you know the inverse of that is so beautiful any anyone can do it anyone you know you'll have to do a ton of personal work to make it artistic and unique but the technicality of it anyone can do it and not anyone can sculpt marble <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do so you ever, do you ever yeah so i was just wondering no go do you ever, it. so when i see someone play the piano oh you froze like for me so i'm just gonna think, hang out and think you're gonna that come years. back that is our why well, um, do sorry you okay? it, it froze. It, fro- it froze for like ten seconds. I didn't hear any of your question. That's cool. Do you, like sometimes when I see someone play the piano, say, I think, man, they're really skilled. They've clearly spent many years dedicating themselves and their time to this craft. That is art, or that is, you know, you, I, I I look at the like you, uh, the Italian painters, or. <clears throat> you know, you look at some of the uh, Renaissance art and you're thinking, fuck, they dedicated their life to this. That makes it art. Do you ever feel like th- this, th- this is what I say. I just pick up a camera and I shoot shit. What I'm, like, I don't know. You get kind of this feeling that you're not really doing anything important. But do you ever get that because photography is so easy? Oh, well, most of the time. I mean, I'd say, yeah. you know, I've, I've taken a lot of beautiful pictures and stuff I'm proud of and stuff I think is great and stuff I think worked well for the people in the photos and stuff I want to share and stuff I want to talk about. But the moments where I made something and got it back for myself outside of Instagram likes or print sales, the moment of times I got it back for myself and said, y- you did it like you did it for you. This is it. This is what you wanted to do and be and say are Oh man, I don't know, less than 10 in my whole life. Hmm. You know, that I would say this is art to me for myself of my own work is is very very few. Uh-huh. Yeah. Is that okay. so in a previous answer you said you wouldn't say you're a successful photographer, but I would say a lot of people from the outside looking in they'd be like, "Oh, he's really successful. He's doing great." Is that part of why you feel you're not successful? That, that's man that's a complicated answer i i'm very anxious and depressed and have a really hard time with capitalism and society and being a person and i artists that have managed to become commercially ex- successful and still be that you know like van gogh or kurt cobain or people that i would associate with that kind of mentality that then still got to share their work on a huge scale i i haven't really found the you're you and this is how it works well in making money and sharing your work and doing gallery shows or making books or I I don't feel like I've integrated it very well with being alive and being a person in the way that some people I feel of even similar dispositions or mentality or thematic work have and I, everyone's always comparing their, themselves to someone so i've really struggled with supporting myself and money while not doing anything i don't want to do and just that the stuff that makes it so meaningful to me is dependent on another person you know it takes those like photographing my niece being born and dying or this dancer that i shared this extremely unique special moment with or some of my friends like Lauren or Rachel, who I formed this connection with over years where we got to these spaces of, oh my God, whoever gets here, like this is so unique and special and amazing is really hard to find. And then I lose it. And then I don't have it in my life and I don't have those people. And then I go back to taking pictures of classic cars in front of houses or sunsets and I do a good job at it and they're fine. But I have this missing the other person element to it so much sometimes. Mm. Yeah. And and I don't know and I'm not good at forcing that. I'm not good at refinding it either. It, it just eventually shows up. 
Hey Greg, do you fancy talking about Wooden Banana for a bit? What, you mean the albums they make? Yeah, hang on. Let's play some of the videos for our viewers. Look at that. They look so good. Do you know anyone that likes making albums for their clients? No. No. I mean, that's why we're filmmakers, so we don't have to do that. <laughs> but we're in Banana, they've sort of simplified the process for everybody. Mm. So it's less options, less confusion, usually means more sales. They've got free album designer for you. They've got editable guides that you can work from. They've just made ordering and selling albums as easy as possible. Yeah, and uh, we, I mean, we've mentioned this already, but how good do they fucking look? Yeah. Those covers, uh, they come in like a classic linen fabric to a more unique suede and velvet. I mean, I... And I have seen these in person as well. They were at the Thrive Workshop that we have continually mentioned on this podcast many a time. They do feel great. I'm yeah. not going to lie. Uh, and speaking to Mark... Hi! They are actually affordable... Uh, which makes selling them worth your time, which is like hugely important. So, uh, I mean, you can't really do much better. Plus... Yes, you can. What? You can do better, because if you use the code PERSPECTIVE and register today, you can get 50% off your first sample album. <laughs> Check that out. Okay, that's pretty good. <laughs> that is pretty good. We do bring it for our listeners. Um, enjoy that promo code. Beautiful products for photographers looking to grow their business through bespoke customer service. Wooden banana. banana. Wooden banana, baby. Say hi. Hi. Meow. <laughs> <laughs> that's Macbeth, that Scottish cat. Oh, nice. Nice. Meow. Cheers, man. So, let's... We've talked a bit about how you shot your first elopement just recently. Yeah. Let's get your, yeah. what's your thoughts on the wedding photography industry? Like you said, you've spoke a lot of conferences, mm. so. Tons. Do you like have 15 any. 16 wedding photography conferences. Yeah. It's truly hilarious that I keep getting, doing that. But I mean, so many of my friends are wedding photographers and I'd say most of the people that come to my workshops and buy my prints are wedding photographers. So. A huge gratitude to an industry of people who are photographers who have disposable income, who care about art and want to make and share that stuff, um, but no insight on the actual industry. I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> you talked earlier about how you're not looking for clients because you don't like the pressure of having to create something that's worth a thousand dollars, whatever. And when you were saying that, I was like, I wonder if like some sort of honesty pricing method would work for him, where it's like, I'll just shoot it and you pay me whatever you want if you do pay me. But then the way you spoke later, I was like, ah, that wouldn't work. I don't know. To be honest, I've been having some thoughts about that because, you know, you have to keep supporting yourself and have to keep going. And Instagram used to be this amazing thing for me. I'd go live and do print sales and sell $6,000 of prints in one Instagram live. And now no one sees my posts. I'm shadow banned. No one... I can't even do live videos anymore, just all this stuff. And my friend Ben Sasso recently posted, like, I've been having a hard time mentally and I'm happy when I'm teaching people, but I don't want to go through the, it, it's $500, who's going to sign up? And he just said, I'm going to schedule out this week of mentor sessions there, pay whatever you want. And if, and if you choose free, that's fine. And the elopement too. It, it went so well under this strict set of, circumstances you know it it sounds pretentious but i'd really just rather not do that under any other conditions and i was thinking that if i wrote it up and shared examples of times and you know i've shot family pictures for friends and i'll i'll do stuff under the you know and then usually i'm like oh i don't want money you can pay for the film or whatever but i'm i don't want the money that if i wrote that up of like these you can hire me to do something for you these are the conditions and and i mean it like it's it's not a sales pitch, like if this doesn't work for you, I'd phenomenally rather not do it. That I might be okay with kind of exploring that. Yeah. That's an interesting idea, Greg. Yeah. Hmm. I like that. I want job, to know Greg. if anyone Yeah, good job from home. <laughs> good job. Uh, I wanna know if anyone has anyone else had that issue? Uh listeners, if you're listening, if you've had that thought about on an honesty box and what would be your what would be your worries about it? Because I'd be worried that Wait, I would are just people listening right now? Like live? 
No. <laughs> no, they're not. Oh, no. Oh, I'm talking okay. to them confused. through time. I maybe there was like a I thought there was like a chat box or something that I didn't know. Um, no, yeah, no, just, yeah. it might be interesting for someone that's maybe of my similar disposition to explore because I mean all your about me pages are book me, we can make it work. You know, like we we can do this. And if I made one it would want to be like I doubt, I doubt this will work, but if you can meet this strict set of circumstances, I might agree to do it for you. It, man, unbelievably pretentious, but I guess that's where we're at. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, yeah, so I was um, having this feeling the other day that um, photographers and, and filmmakers in the wedding industry uh, really, I mean, there's a hard balance between like being brave enough to create the images that you want from a from a wedding day and facing the fact that at the end of the day like obviously something you struggle with someone has given you money to to essentially do what they want kind of i i i feel like with our clients they tend to be hey just just you do you it doesn't always work out, but do, do you, do you st- I mean, obviously you do struggle with that, but do you have any advice for, for, for people who do, but still rely on the income or just, just finding what it is to you? You know, I think there's a lot of beauty in you're artistic and you know how to take good photos, but you're, you're a service employee. Mm. They're getting married. They don't care about art the art scene or the photography scene, they want beautiful wedding photos just like everyone else has. And maybe that's fine. Mm -hmm. Maybe, I mean, I really have no thoughts on the wedding industry. Do whatever you have to do to support yourself and find yourself and be happy. And if it doesn't Mm -hmm. work to make your work for clients, come up with a, you know, come up with a personal project. And that's so much easier said than done because we have so many time and money constraints that what do everything you do and go be an artist. Yeah. Um, I just, I just settled on a place of, I was really, really unhappy when photography came into my life and it was a little bit of a savior. You know, it really turned into this. I need this so much. This is so important to me to do this right. That then when it got mixed with like, well, you could be for hire, you could do this for other people. It eventually just turned into, I'm not sure you could. Hmm. And and that's just where, that's just where I landed. Yeah. In asking the question, I was kind of thinking: is is it is it a little bit gross that we are trying to create images? Oh, I don't know. I don't. I don't know how to word this. It's not for ourselves. I mean, I, I'm sure there are people who are literally taking photographs for their portfolio. But it's like when you're having ideas about someone's wedding, is is that is that gross? Like, I don't know. Man, everything's gross. I think it's just yeah. where you can settle on personal comfort and meaning. Yeah. You know, okay. right now we're in a society where your value is what you can produce and how much it can be worth and what that can be exchange for you know your value is this metric thing of time and dollars and personal worth and ability instead of you're valuable because you exist you're valuable because you're here and so it's very hard to find the space of i'm going to just be and make things and it People like my work. People will buy my prints and come to workshops. You know, it's real easy for me to say, just do that. Just find something you like. Mm-hmm. I did, and people react to it enough to keep me alive. But what if it was so off? You know, Van Gogh sold, what, one painting in his whole life? What if, and yeah. it's so, his work's so meaningful to me. But what mm-hmm. if it doesn't work? There's still so much beautiful and beauty and meaning and unique avenues for creation in that space but if it doesn't sustain you where does that get you i, I struggle with all that all the time yeah uh, but and, and i i struggle with my own part of it too that i really wanted it 
I really wanted photography to make me love myself. And I thought it was going to when I got good at it and when it got emotional and when people connected to it and people responded to it and I had a community around Mm -hmm. it, I thought it was going to change how I felt about myself. And it didn't. It gave me tons of friends that I love and experiences that were very valuable to me and Mm -hmm. stuff I got to see and create and do that I couldn't have imagined being on the table. But I'm pretty sure deep down I wanted it to make me love me. And it didn't do that. And when I kind of accepted that, that was that was a really hard revelation. I think it slowed down my shooting quite a bit because you can put so much frantic energy into a thing that's going to fix something. And when it mm-hmm. when it couldn't fix that, that affected how I was seeing and shooting as well. Yeah. Sorry, I cut you off. What were you going to say? No. Uh, I can't actually remember. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you were saying that people like to buy your prints and I was... <laughs> In my head, I was like, people are trying to buy our prints, but they always I, seem to be very sold out. Con- we're going we're gonna to talk about that at the end of the podcast, because <laughs> nothing should be sold out. We'll, we'll get into that at the end. Okay. I mean, this was like a month ago. Was that a month ago? Maybe it was, maybe it was more than that, actually. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm going to read a quote that you wrote somewhere. <laughs> somewhere that I found. I can't let remember. Me, let me quote this to you. Why did you say this? It's very sexist and racist, homophobic, intolerant. Please, please respond. Oh my God, you white male. Um, I, I want to feel that life is more than just consuming. I want to know why I'm here. I want to know, I want to know the purpose of my life. And you mentioned, um, that you wanted to find love for yourself in the work that you made in photography. Have you, have you found that purpose that you were referring to in that moment? Right. Or how, let's see, let's see how much more depressing we can make this by the end of the <laughs> podcast. No, I mean, I don't think there is one. I think that's another one of the crazy paradoxes of life is that there is no meaning. And that's so scary but then you know the immediate turnaround is well you get to create the meaning you get to imbue things with meaning and beauty and say this is what it's about and explore it and i just go back and forth between those of getting into something and finding it interesting and beautiful and trying to see what i feel and Mm. feeling happier when i make something that people say meant a lot to them and it fills me with some you know, brain chemical that releases that says this is good. And that's part of our humanness. And I participate that in that. And then I will slide back into moments of like, but it doesn't matter. You're just pretending like it does. And then I say, wait, I know that's the whole thing we're doing. That's all it is. And sometimes the we're doing it and getting into it and it's beautiful is fun and fine. And sometimes I go through spells where it doesn't seem to matter. Lots actually. I, I, I feel like I go through that as well. In fact, I I, I get very confused when I hear debates. I, li- I like to listen. I don't know if I've said this on the podcast before. I like to listen to a lot of debates. I like to listen to a lot of like atheist chat shows and stuff. And um, <clears throat> I can't remember who the who the talk. Uh, I, I I can't remember who who this was. We were talking about um, free will, and that we didn't have free will. And then was it Sam we, Harris? <laughs> It was Sam Harris. That was it. Yes. Well yeah. done. Well done. Uh, you, you know, and he's got a couple of books on the subject, obviously, uh, but it kind of blows your mind. You're like, what? My God, nothing really matters and you have no control. And uh, so just enjoy yourself is where I'm kind of trying to get to. Just enjoy this little speck of dust that is your life in the grand scheme of time. His insight of how could you have free will if you're not choosing your thoughts, you know, they're just already there, was actually a big insight into my teaching and public speaking. The first oh, really? time I the first time I had to present at a wedding photography conference in Spain, it was like 400 people in Madrid or something. I was really terrified. Mm-hmm. I don't know how to prepare a speech. I'm not a good public speaker. I don't know what to say. I don't know what will be of value. Mm-hmm. And mixed with some of those kind of insights... I thought, you have a, I don't know how other people are because I'm not inside their heads, but I have a very clear internal monologue 
My thoughts don't feel like nebulous. They feel like English sentences. And I just had the thought of, I'm just going to say everything I'm thinking out loud. I'm not mm. going to go through the process of, okay, this is something I think about. What would be a good way to say that? I'm just, so I don't speak with, I spoke at way up north for like two and a half hours once in Rome. And I didn't, I didn't make a single speaker note. I just uh, get a nice. collection of images that feels meaningful to me, put them in an order that feels like I could talk about them, and mm -hmm. then just get up and narrate my entire stream of consciousness yeah. looking at the work. Mm -hmm. And and so that was kind of an interesting revelation from you don't choose your thoughts, and they're kind of determining who you are, which is really scary. But I guess you could just start saying most of them out loud in relation to people wanting to know what you're thinking or about your work. Yeah. Does that ever get you into trouble? It gets me into trouble. I, I would, you know, I, I'm not trying to say anything horrible, but when I talk or when I present, I talk a lot about complicated truths that, mm. and I don't mean to say it dis disrespectfully, but I could say some really weird sentences that would sound offensive like shooting my niece's funeral was one of the best days of my life mm. so often i'm trying to feel like something i do matters so often i'm going through the motions and at the end of the day i think that was so useless you just had to get five dollars so you could buy a sandwich so you didn't starve to death and you just have to do it again but on that day when my sister and brother-in-law said we love your work. We need these memories. We need you to shoot this. I was filled with such a sense of purpose that I've had so few times in my life that while I was heartbroken and I wanted more than anything else for it not to be happening, my internal state of you matter and what you do is good and you are good at what you do and being good at what you do is going to make a difference to people was some of the highest it had ever been. And I was feeling that at the same time, like you are good, you are of worth, you matter. The things you invested your time and energy to are important and worthwhile and were a good decision. I feel that that strongly, I don't know, 10 times in my whole life. So I wouldn't say it's gotten me into trouble, but I don't mind saying things that are complicated truths in yeah. in talking about my work, I guess. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Let's, let's switch gears and talk about like your actual photography. How would you describe your style of photography if someone was to ask you? <laughs> Yeah, another complicated, not complicated truth, but just like contradiction. I would call it like arranged documentary work. <laughs> you know, I think most people would think of documentary work of like, you're just the observer, you're not interfering. It's not a creator process. It's a documentary process where mine has been like, let's get this person in this situation, in this light, and then see what, ha see what happens. So I, I, I mean, I, I don't feel very tied to a school of like editorial or beauty, beauty or fashion photographers, even though I work with models a lot. I feel way more personally in a documentary category, but then I'm arranging all the things to happen, like a set up documentary, like a Christopher Guest thing, like a This is Spinal Tap, like a fake <laughs> documentary. I think that's yeah. probably how I would describe it. Uh huh. So you obviously mentioned your vast array of film cameras to your right, perhaps. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe this image is... It is my right. Oh, there you go. Uh, I suppose I had a 50-50 guess. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, that might scare a lot of photographers, you know, shooting on film. I think most of our listeners are digital shooters. Maybe a small majority might hobby in film, much like I did. Um, what, what about film... Like, why, like why film? I, I mean, I can talk for three... I have a YouTube video with my film lab that's probably two hours long of answering this, but the short answer is... So we're... Us right now, we're talking about stuff we care about and trying to connect and being Simon and Greg and Ryan and getting into it and talking about dogs and crying and God and stuff. One second. 
how how's that feel? <laughs> you know, when you when you're talking to a friend and they pick up their phone, like yep. oh. not great. To me, yeah. that's the screen on the back of a digital camera. You're in the moment of feeling this unique thing and observing it, and it's actually hitting your brain, and you're looking in their eyes, and they're looking in your eyes, and you want it to be this thing, and then you click it, and you go, look. All of a sudden, the focus went from this, whoop, sucked right into the thing. And even if it's beautiful, and you're like, oh, we did it. Now you're there. Now you're in the camera, not in the room. And it can go so much worse than that. Mm. Oh, my God. This means so much to me. You look so unique and beautiful. Oh my God, I hate it. Oh, I hate how I look in that. Du- you know, done. Like, yeah. why film is because screens were destroying the kind of interaction I was trying to have. Mm. Even in a positive, even in the positive way. Okay. So, how do you- no- I mean, now I love the cameras and I love the aesthetic. It produces a physical negative. I love grain. I love that film cameras come in. 30 different shapes and sizes and now I'm using a rangefinder. Now I'm looking down into it. Now you have to set it up and get it under a dark cloth. Just the way different ways of approaching making an image that are not as available on digital. I love that about film. And then ser- and then serendipity. Serendipity barely, barely exists in digital. I've had shots from ruined film or negatives that got overdeveloped or torn in the lab or the start of the roll where it only exposed half the picture or loaded the wrong film in the camera and underexposed it by four stops where I got it back and thought, oh my God, this is one of my favorite pictures I've ever made and I didn't even mean to do that. Inviting this element of chemistry and unpredictability and all these other people being involved in it and someone has to develop it correctly and sometimes they don't and i know that's a huge negative for a lot of people especially trying to deliver something consistent to a client but i made my favorite art series i've ever made from myself was this series of self portrait long exposure nudes Mm. with one of my friends where i mentioned we taped the camera to the ceiling I got in a dark room. I got a point and shoot that had an F8 or F11 lens. I loaded it with ISO 50 film and then just hit go on it. And you're a photographer, a dark room, ISO 50, F11. What's that going to be? Two or three seconds? Yeah. So what did the pictures look like? Right when we were done shooting. Hey, what did those look like? I No idea. Here, hold on. I got one on my wall. Ah, yes. Cool. (laughs) That's one of my favorite shots I've ever made. And right after the moment happened where it was created, if someone had said like, hey, what what did you just do? What did that look like? My honest answer would have been, I have no idea. Some kind of dark, underexposed, color-shifted, blurry thing, I guess. (laughs) So, the uh, yeah, serendipity, no screens, and availability of different types of gear that will force you to shoot differently are why film for me. Mm. It's just so is fucking it, beautiful. Yeah. Is, is is that serendipitous type feeling the thing that... Uh, like is it the reason... I'm sure there are many reasons, obviously, but is is that why you love that image in particular? Because you didn't yeah, know... I, what, yeah. Like... It, you know, I lost my faith in God and magical things, and art was a lot of bringing that back into my life, of mm. something in this is outside of my control. Like, inviting that air of unpredictability and uncertainty, that's that's very hard to get with digital, because you see what you did a 500th of a second later in exactness. And for some people, that's yeah. such a great asset of producing consistent technical work for clients. But for me, nothing about that was helpful to what I was trying to make. Mm. And and then just to get all Pinteresty or Tumblr-y or awful, awful hipster quotey on you, film feels like memories to me. Film feels so much closer to me of what it felt like to be there yeah. than digital does. It's too it's too exact. And I want mm. some bit of you know, when you think of your memory, it's not this 4k hd second by second replay of exactly what that experience was it's these nebulous feelings and flashes of emotion and light and feeling and film 
inherently has some of the, and I'm not saying it does for everybody. I'm not speaking some grand truth, but when I work it, when I look at my, you know, I have a digital camera. I bring it sometimes. I break it every one, every couple months, I break it out and shoot side by side. And then I get home, I it uplo- I upload the digital, I throw 400 different presets on it because I don't know how to choose. I finally settle on it and I look at it and I'm like, damn, this looks good. And it's already done. This is so much easier and cheaper. And I get, what am I thinking? This is great. And then I get the film back from the lab three weeks later. Not that it's three weeks, but you know, weeks mm-hmm. later, I get the film back. I f- save it up for a month. I do this on purpose. I save my film for a month, a month and a half, two months. Then I mail it. Then they work on it for a week. Then I get it. And when I pull it up on the screen, I have this, oh, remember when we were in that room? Remember talking about that? And the physicality of the image and the grain and the imperfections and the exposure differences and the color palettes and all that hits me in a personal way of like, this feels so much more like what it felt to be there than the digital image I finished. And that's, that's a big draw for me. Yeah. Yeah. Is there, wait, with the serendipitous aspect, is there a lot of pre-production that goes into your shoots? Like, do you, do you oh organize God, quite a bit of it? None. Yeah. Oh, oh, so little space, time, person. And that's, I'm, I'm famous for not having a good plan and it bites me all the time. Like I just can't choose anywhere or, have an image in my head to make. I just get someone I want to be with and see what happens. Uh huh. And you, I know you work with, well, you mentioned that you worked with a majority of your friends. Like, have you ever worked with people who you didn't know right off the bat that you oh, had yeah, to kind of reach out to? And, and, and what was, what was that process like? I, I mean, the dancer, Emma, who I made my favorite image ever of, I've shot her once in my whole life for 45 minutes on the day we met with less than an hour to work. So, I mean, that definitely happens. But a lot of the people that I've made some of my favorite work with, it's recurring, you know, because I'm shooting differently. I'm trying to explain, like, I don't want to have an expectation of what we want to do. I want to talk about this. I want to spend this time. I want to see if it turns into something. And then if you get something back where, it, you know, it's like, oh, whoa, I love these then the freedom for the next time to be like, see, we don't have to do that. Let's, let's try again. And you're already so much further ahead the next time you work that you can just mm-hmm. be here. Sorry, I keep leaving, but I want to show you this print too. That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> oh, oh boy. Ooh, what's this? Hard to see with the pixelation. Um, I just showed that. That's my friend Runa. Um, and we, again, had like an hour in Paris. But we had met in Amsterdam under really unique circumstances. And our first shoot, just some crazy stuff happened. Probably shouldn't share all that. It's not totally my story, just story to share. Just the place we were both in and what we were going through. And what we ended up shooting was such a special, unique experience that the next time we were in the same place and had, I don't know, an hour and a half to shoot... And I wanted to see, I can't speak French, but uh, the Père Lachaise Cemetery where all Napoleon's marshals are buried and everything. You know, we walked around there and instead of trying to do this like cemetery photo shoot, we're both in the space of like, we can just walk around and be here. And I think, I think I shot, oh man, so few, like 16 images while we were there, I was on medium format film and didn't have a lot on me. Shot so few frames. It's got to be more than 10, but it might be like 20 images in, the whole time because we weren't in the space of like, well, now what? Like change the pose over here. Yeah. Just, just be here. And in the few times it was like, oh, this, oh, this is one of them. That this is the thing. Mm-hmm. This and then moving on, not to the next shot, just to back to being there. And, and we got to do that, I think, because of our first shoot. You know, if, if we mm-hmm. had just met under like, well, we have an hour. I love your work. I'm a model. You're a photographer. Let's go shoot something. It would, it'd be harder to occupy that space and make almost nothing. Yeah. Yeah. When you are with your friends, that your models, um, what, do, do you 
I, I know you're looking for a moment, you're looking for an experience, but in that, do you do you pose people? Oh, do yeah, you, I mean, I'm, I'm not... And it's, I, I suppose when I, when I asked that, I, I didn't mean it to sound like, oh, it's either like you're posing people not real, you're not posing people real. You know, I would say I, mean? I make adjustments to it, but most of the time... Simon, if I was going to yes. make a portrait of you... And I wanted it to feel like you. And we walked into a room. I'd never be like, okay, now hunch over and I want your hand by your mouth, but not totally under. I want some fingers curled and resting on your chin. And I want one in between your lips. Like how you're holding. And then people stop doing it when you point yeah. it out. But how people <laughs> hold themselves when they're not being photographed has so much physicality and emotion in it. And then when you go to take a photo, it's all gone. So, I'm looking for, let's just do this. Let's have a podcast. And then if we were in person and you'd been sitting there, I might have been like, Simon, don't move. And then get it. And that's more the basis of how I shoot. But then it's like, oh, well, the light's a little bit weird. Can we actually, you know, like turn this way or... But it's focused in not shooting. Like not shooting is the mm -hmm. focus of my photo shoots. And then when people... And I talk, and you know, and I'm not saying like, oh, what's... I'm trying to talk about stuff I actually care about in these moments and hear it from them. And you know when people get animated and they're just holding themselves how they do when they care about something and aren't being photographed, that's what I want to shoot. So okay. I, I do th I do that. <laughs> yeah. And you're and you're just like very good at seeing those opportunities to then whip out your camera. K kind of like very, the in very yeah. good at it. Okay. Just kidding. Yeah, no, oh, I, I just I had to teach myself that of yeah. the models sitting there getting their hair done, being on their phone and how they like sit when they're doing a thing is so much more emotional and physically communicating something than all my poses. So mm. maybe I just have to structure the shoot around not shooting and then explain if I say, oh, this is it. That's what we're going to shoot. And that's that's the most unique thing I would have to communicate about my shooting process to people I'm working with is mm -hmm. most of the times when the moment's right, they're in the middle of saying something they care about. They're communicating something. And then I'm like, stop talking. Don't move. You know, I'm cutting people off from telling something important all the time. Yeah. Yeah. You, but I just explain that that's how I work. Yeah. When you're on a shoot, you're obviously not going into that going, I want to get like 10 photos from this. And you're not coming no, out no. with, oh, I typically shoot mm -hmm. this amount of images. So how is there a moment That's in like, a shoot where you is there a moment in a shoot where you end up feeling I'm comfortable with what I've got? Like I've got something good from this. Exhaust exhaustion. Because <laughs> it's usually friends, you know, and we usually have a set amount of time. Yeah. Like that happened with Rachel and I, this amazing artist friend who I made work with for like five years, just I've probably shared like 200 images we've made and there's probably 10,000 that I've finished. Like, it's just an unbelievable amount of work. We would just shoot to exhaustion, like until yeah. we just physically mm -hmm. couldn't do it anymore. But no, and, and yeah. that's another photographer question I get constantly that I never have a good answer to. How much film do you shoot on a shoot? How do you know when you've got it? Just, we just stop when we stop. Yeah. As opposed to going back to your favorite image, you didn't even know you had got it. It just mm -mm, not at happened all. that you did. and Not at all at all. I mean, it wasn't even a moment where I would have said like, oh my God, that's going to be good. Because she was dancing. I was moving with her. I was shooting like five year expired Cinestill film, which had just degraded to hell. Five years. And then I... And then I underexposed the film like three stops on purpose just to completely fuck everything up on purpose. So it wasn't even a moment of moving and shooting and being like, oh, damn, that one's going to be like no idea, which just made it extra special when mm. I got it. I'll, I'll send it to you guys after. It's not like a secret. I just don't like it on Instagram, but I'll send you the photo after. Hey, I'm Ashley from With Jack. 
and one of the sponsors of the Perspective podcast. With Jack helps to keep photographers in business by supporting them financially and legally if they have problems with a client or they make a mistake in their work. We've all had that fear of our CF card or our hard drive failing and losing important photos. You can find out more at withjack.co.uk. Head over there and find out how we can help you be a confident creative. The 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 overthinker in me has these little flurries of thought about what I shoot or what other people shoot and you know, what things are or how they appear to be like um, is something emotional because I'm shooting an emotion or is it some kind of like existential thing that I'm placing on something when I take an image I don't know if this is making sense with the words that are coming out of my mouth but do you do you have this idea of like like why why do you find something emotional or like I don't know I, I gotta say this is just another selling point of film for me because mm-hmm. when you're in that headspace and you're making it and then you look at it, mm. you know, it's instantly like, is, is this it? Was, was this right? Did this get it? Am, mm. am I proud of this? Am I excited? It's too immediate. When I see my work a month and a half after I make it, I get to see it like a viewer. I get to go through the images like they're someone else's work. Obviously, I remember being there, but so many times, you know, I'll see an image going through the roll of film one at a time. And I think, oh, that's so close. Like if only, and then the next image, I fixed it. You know, I I, I worked on it in that way. And then oh, I have an actual emotional response to it. Like, oh my God, that's so mm. much better. Oh, and I don't think I could ever get that looking at the work that night. You know, like I need the detachment so that when I see the work, I'm having, I don't want to say better, but you know what I mean? If it was digital and I was like, hey, Greg, I want to take your portrait, click, "Mm, that sucks. Or Mm. click, oh, Greg, you look really nice. Don't you think really, you look really nice? That's a different set of reactions to me than making your portrait, coming home, mailing the film, getting it back, the roll comes up, and then I see it and think, oh, damn, that's Greg. That's when we were in that room and I thought the light was going to be too low and uh, I didn't want to use a 50, so I switched to the 35 and I got closer. I'm having this set of reactions to it that are more based on emotion than I am, did it turn out well? Because I need to know right now. Yeah. It's just a different set to me. It's like the delayed yeah. gratification sort of thing. And delayed disappointment. Yeah. And like, oh my God, mm-hmm. why didn't you shoot it in black and white? Why did you think this would work even a negative reaction like that to me is still more emotional yeah and i I just prefer that have you have you ever um developed your own film at home oh yeah i just i'm lazy and fidgety and my lab (laughs) indie film lab just does such i've used them for like 12 years now i mean they've developed thousands and thousands thousands of rolls of film for me and they know Mm -hmm. me we're friends we have a personal relationship Mm -hmm. and that to me just works so much better for me yeah but yeah i I went to college i did darkroom stuff developed all my own film for years printed in the darkroom i've done all that just Mm. for where i'm at right now with everything getting shared digitally and printed and all that it makes more sense for me to be using a lab and my lab's just so good. Yeah. You said you, had, you said you did an episode of what, a podcast with them. Another one. Oh, they, they were doing a little YouTube series, pandemic YouTube okay. series where we did a series of like five or six chats. They're on their YouTube channel. One was cool. like, okay. why do you shoot film? Two was if you could only have one camera and one lens for the rest of your life, what would it be? And why? Oh, geez. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't mind tech talk. I love cameras. I love lenses. I love yeah. getting into it. I don't, so 
yeah, we, we just we did a series of chats like that. Talking mm-hmm. and, and they actually, have a they have a conference, an all film conference called Long Live Film, and we did the first one right before the pandemic, and we were supposed to do the second one right after, and then you know COVID, but we're doing it again in October, and I'm speaking at it, and I'm super happy to be going back. Cool. Yeah. Sorry, Greg, you were going to say something no, before. Just I, when you were talking about gear, there it made me remember that last day or two I've seen you post a lot of gear for sale on Instagram, and like. I saw it and was like, what's going on? Like, is he just clearing out, giving up? Oh, I, I, no, I'm, oh my God, no, I'm selling like two cameras. I probably have 25. I'm just a, <laughs> I'm a, just like everybody. I'm just a nightmare of acquiring every single camera and lens so I can try it. And then it comes spring and you're like, what have you done? <laughs> Look at this. You don't even, you haven't touched half of these in years. So it's just an endless cycle of, but I love that about film. I've, I've owned like 75 different film cameras and I feel, I love having tried them all. Yeah. Holy shit. I suppose, yeah. uh, have, have you had a moment with every single one of those? Because that's quite a, sp- that's a high specific number. I don't think I would be able to recall how many cameras. Oh, I've, I mean, I was, uh, I was exaggerating, but it has to be okay. in the 70s. Yeah. Okay. I just, I just love trying stuff out. I have, I have three main cameras that are like 80% of my work has been made on a Pentax 672, a Leica mm-hmm. MP, and a Nikon FM3A two 35 millimeter cameras, one rangefinder, one SLR, and then a medium format SLR. And that's most of my work. That's like my go-to three that I have to bring. Yeah. And how would you, like what dictates what to you when you go and do a shoot? Like which one do you know which, like, do you have an idea of what kind of feel you want to go to and that's the body that you reach for or? Um, I love shooting my Leica because it makes me want to shoot. I don't know if you guys have ever met a German, but damn, they make some beautiful mechanical items. I love holding it. I love the history. I love how it feels. I love that I have a Leica that was made before my dad was born. It feels, I just, yeah. all the aesthetics of it just make me be like, I want to use this thing. This is so fucking beautiful. I just want to hold it and I want to take pictures with it. And I appreciate that. I appreciate a camera that makes me want to make a photo. So I use that for that reason. Also documentary stuff like shooting my niece, shooting funerals that I've been doing recently. It's very quiet for a film camera. It's very low profile. Um, So it's great for documentary work. And then the Nikon and the Pentax I use because they can focus so close. I love, most of my work is on a 35 millimeter lens equivalent. Even my Mm -hmm. portraits, most of them are 35 millimeter. And the Pentax is very unique for a medium format camera in that it makes lenses that can focus very, very close. Most medium format gear is like a meter, you know, is as close as you can get. And the Pentax is unique in that they made several lenses that can focus down to like seven inches and stuff like very close for medium format. And the Nikon also has some very close focusing lenses and I often like shooting close. So those are chosen out of being great cameras and that they could do that. Yeah. Uh, Greg, you mentioned social media. Ryan, did you, what, what's your thoughts on social media? Because I'm pretty sure you had some issues a, a few weeks ago, maybe. Oh, to ongoing. Do with cens- censorship. I, I'm oh. shadow banned. My name doesn't come up when people search for my account. I don't want to talk about it too much. Everyone knows. It's, you have to be there because that's where everyone is and that's how I sell workshop seats and prints and it's so sad because it used to be such a beautiful space and then they figured out how to make money with it and that involved ruining the beautiful space and Mm. I've used social media as like if you needed cigarettes to survive (laughs) I know it's damaging I know it's bad for me I know it makes bad habits and bad thoughts about myself and comparison We had a president who said comparison is the thief of joy. And I think that's so Mm -hmm. true. And social media is a comparison machine. It's unavoidable. And I need it right now. And I am in no position to give advice because I'm not using it healthily. It haunts me. I obsess over it. It hurts my Mm -hmm. feelings. And then people write me the most beautiful messages on it. I posted a picture of clouds the other day. And someone in Germany wrote me this long message of just like, hey, I don't write messages to strangers, but I just want you to know how much this meant. I lost the love of my life to leukemia just barely, and he was only 29 years old, and I'm atheist, and I'm really struggling with 
all that and looking at this photo, I felt him. I felt what it was like to feel him. And I just wanted to say thank you. And I, how was I going to have that, that experience in my life without Instagram? You know what I mean? And so there's, and I've met Mm. 80% of my best friends on it. You know, I, I've seen all the places I've seen in the world because of it. I'm just, it's like if, it's like if you needed cigarettes to stay alive, like, you know what they're doing to you, but they're keeping you going. It's, yeah, it's really and with hard. with that, here's Ryan's sponsor. <gasps> cigarettes? <laughs> oh, no, I don't smoke yet. It's probably coming. Um, yeah, shout out to uh, cigarettes. Oof. <laughs> Oh, going old school here. Everyone's like, what's a cigarette? Yeah. A little stick of death. There you go. Um. <laughs> I saw I saw such a funny meme the other day that said, this plant-based replacement can get kids off vaping, and it was a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> this plant-based oh, alternative yeah. can stop kids from vaping. Oh, man. Oh. I loved it. Oh, don't don't get me started on oh um, see see marketing bullshit like natural and fat free and plant based. I'm like oh my god! Like you guys are in the UK, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, we're Scotland. Yeah. Oh, I want to come back to Scotland so bad. My last name's Murheed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. Scottish by descent. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. I, man, I love Scotland so much. I, single malt scotch is about my favorite thing in the whole world. I'm pretty obsessed with it. I'm desperate to come mm. back. Oh, what's your, what's your go-to? What's your drink of choice for whiskey? Oh, man, we can go forever. I mean, Lagavulin 16 Ooh. is one of them. Oh, so you like the a Glen smoky Mo- number? I do, but I like everything. For my 40th birthday, my younger brother bought me a bottle of Glenmorangie's Signet, which is like a $240 bottle. It has 40 mm. year in the blend, and it was just, mm. oh, my God, it was insane. Wow. I still have, like, nice. this much of it left. I have one tiny special occasion sip left. Yeah. Let me tell you something recently that, not that I learned, I was I was new, but it uh, totally makes sense. So I started collecting whiskey maybe a couple, like, five, maybe five years ago. So I've got a big shelf of them. But obviously when I get one, I have to have, like, that's kind of like the moment of experience. Like I'm like, I've got this whiskey, who am I with? I'll have one, we'll have a little taste creating memories and all that kind of stuff. Well, whiskeys oxidize, and when they oxidize, their their profile changes, and they kind of dull, they become lifeless after a while. And uh, I didn't notice this until uh, maybe two months ago when I'm actually going back to one of the first whiskeys that I bought, um, and it was a bit lifeless. And I was like, is this... Is this there's a term in whiskey that I can't can't remember what it is. I'm sure it's not just whiskey, but it's like when your taste, when your palate is like affected by the mood, the experience. And I always forget the name of this. I've brought this up on, a, on the podcast a couple of times. Um, and I was like, is it this? Is that what, is that what's happened? Uh, no, it's just uh, the, the whiskeys have, have slowly lost their character and, and, and become dull. And it's really heartbreaking because, like I said, every time I got one, I would open one. So now I have all these fucking dying whiskeys. Um, Get them in a box. Fed, FedEx, or, or I'm on my way. <laughs> I'll be there. <laughs> Come on over. Um, yeah, but I, I, I was lucky enough uh, to be gifted, uh, like like you mentioned, an expensive whiskey. Um, and it was from my favorite distillery. What? Uh, the Glen, it's, a, it's a Glen Goyne. Uh, it, it's my favorite whiskey distillery because one, it's probably the closest one next to me. Uh, or near me, uh, so I feel it's kind of got that kind of home. Oh, this mm-hmm. is where I'm from type thing. Um, I'm not. I mean, I'm getting there with the smoky taste, but it's it's kind of like it's one of the kind of first whiskeys that I was really like getting into. So it's really easy drinking. Um, but it was like um, a gift. It was like this 500 pound bottle that's sitting on my shelf, and every time I look to it, yeah, I know it's cr- uh, yeah crazy like. Thank you, Uncle. Um, <laughs> I see it and I think, shit, that's aging. But then I also think, fuck, that is 
fucking 500 yeah. pounds worth of whiskey right there. I can't just be drinking this on a Saturday night. But at the same time, it's going to be dying. So I am that guy who's like drinking alone trying to make memories with myself which is very expensive it's, it's just this weird like the takeaways from I, this podcast are maybe start smoking and try drinking alone <laughs> try make drink memories with alone. yourself drinking a yeah. whiskey like uh, honestly and uh, I don't know it's just uh, yeah Simon I, that yeah. sounds like such such a special bottle and I just want to say how touched I am you offered to give me that for doing this podcast <laughs> It's it's well, has too risky but, to transport you know, that. If, it would leak in the, the it's shipping. Too risky. I'll it come is, get it. it I, too, I'll, I'll come it, get it. it. I got <laughs> frequent flyer miles. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, if, if you are in Scotland and there's still some left, I promise to give you some, even if it's dead. So um, yeah. Neil Thomas Douglas, who you must know, yep. is trying to get me to come back for his wife's 40th birthday party later this All year. Right. So maybe I'll actually be there. Yes, yeah. yes, we've had Neil twice on this podcast. Actually, he's, he's a good friend such of ours. A joy. Yeah. Yeah. He there is, is no one better to get a drunk FaceTime call than Neil <laughs> and his wife. I'm not kidding. Like world best. <laughs> uh, well, you know what? Now I'm sad that I haven't had one of those drunk calls from. You should from request Neil. one. Try and get on the list. It's, it's special when you get them. I'll I'll get on the list. Yeah, me and Greg will will <laughs> we'll get one. Uh, oh my god, that's hilarious, Ryan. Thank you very much for giving us uh, over an hour, no, over two hours and 1751 seconds of your time. Uh, probably more than that because of, uh, you know, citywide blackouts or, or whatever it was. And uh, yeah, tech issues this morning, honestly. Yeah, of course, but it's really nice you. to talk to you guys. Your voices are making me miss Scotland a lot. <laughs> <laughs> In, so is that whiskey? Oh, uh, you know what? More than the whiskey, though, those Walkers or McAdams pop it on mango crisp chips. Oh my God, we don't have them in the U.S. Neil got them for me the first time in Scotland, and I can't stop thinking about them. They are the best Hang on. chips. Like pop it on mango. Crisps. Yeah. Huh. Yes. I think Walkers okay. is the brand. All right. It could be. Uh... I can sort of Okay. Okay. I, I tell you what, we'll, we'll, we'll send you some. We'll send there you we some. There go. Now I'm like, right. now I can't start. Oh, oh my God. Here they are. Sensations. Oh, okay. The oh, sensations. mango, oh. not the lime ones, the mango ones. This yeah, is my favorite chip ones. I've ever had in my whole life. I, I think about them every time I hear someone with a Scottish <laughs> accent. That's the big takeaway. Oh, Those awesome. crisps are amazing. Uh, I don't think I've ever had them, strangely enough. I have had I sensations. I have had the lime ones. Yeah. And I was like, meh, lime. I don't know. Our, our I much French prefer, like, spicy jalapeno and cheese uh, Max crisps. Oh, man, they are good. My wife just discovered them recently. My goodness. They don't last in the cupboard very long. Well, anyway, sorry, Ryan. We, uh, <laughs> we did it. For, this was lovely. Yeah. We did it. Uh for people who are interested in checking out your work, where can people find you online? Uh, RyanMuirhead.com. I actually spent some time starting to update my website yesterday. Um, I'm on Instagram, but no one ever sees it. And half the time, if you search my name, it doesn't even come up. So I don't know. Googling my name brings up me and whoever that Scottish sportsman is now, but I'm still owning most of the top page. So <laughs> Google will get you there. I, I genuinely can't wait to Google you now. I need to see who this other Ryan Muirhead is. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if you can find Ryan's um, Instagram, please do check out his work. There you go. In fact, why not? If you're looking for any art for your house, as I am, why don't you go to his pick time? It's on, it's on my website. People can find us at cinematefilms.co.uk on Instagram, Facebook, and on TikTok sometimes. Uh, we hope you do love this episode, and if you did, you can join us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash perspective by cinema. For as little as a pound, you can support the podcast, and that's where we post all of our bonus content when you go to the next tier. I can't remember. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> the next tier has all my uh, self-portrait nudes on it that I submitted for this podcast, yeah. so up it to five pounds, people. <laughs> 
<laughs> your uh, your lab is. Uh, they must have seen you nude so many times. They have. Uh, that's what. <laughs> Um, anyway, if you if you don't want to pay for the perspective podcast, totally, totally cool. Um, you can, of course, hit subscribe and get this podcast for free wherever you get podcasts. And um, yeah, thank you for for listening. Um, and if you enjoyed this, leave a review. If you didn't, don't leave a review. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, no, that. no, if. It's, if you have a negative thing to say, that's absolutely fine. You can put it in the comments and we'll change our lives for Name you. Name one time anyone's uh, ever said anything negative in a YouTube comment. Hmm, can't think of any. <laughs> <laughs> it's where humanity comes together to celebrate. Yeah. It, was, it was pretty much the birthplace of depression. Uh, mm. The YouTube comments, pretty much. Um, anyway, thank you very much for listening. However, in the meantime... Enjoy your life. <laughs>